All right, welcome back to another edition of our May Day Monday. This is the May Day Monday for April of 2022. Um, just real quick, I want to thank Fire Engineering for posting this, for hosting it. Uh, Peter and uh, the crew there has really gone out of their way to help get the message out. Um, Peter's bent over backwards and changed his schedule so that um, he would come in and record whenever the guests are available. And uh, that does not go unnoticed. It really makes a makes an impact with me that um, he does go out of his way and fire engineering goes out of their way to, to keep getting the message out. So May Day Monday, April 2022. Uh, we'll start off again as we have with the past few May Days. Um, since the last time we met, we want to mention those firefighters who we, we have lost in the line of duty. Uh, and since the last time we met, uh, there was a captain from North Carolina who died of a heart attack. Uh, there was a chief from Delaware who was injured during cleanup at the firehouse and uh, suffered a, um, a uh, fatal injury. A firefighter from Michigan was found unresponsive in the firehouse. A Missouri firefighter was killed in a truck crash. A um, New Jersey firefighter died after uh, training other firefighters all day. He had been involved with training. After that, he came back, was feeling ill and um, passed away. A firefighter in Oklahoma died while fighting a wildland fire, and an Ohio firefighter suffered a medical emergency at a firehouse. Uh, so far in 2022, we have lost 30 firefighters in the line of duty. Uh, so let's never forget their sacrifice, and we'll stay. Uh, just take a moment of silence to remember them. I thank you for that. And again, uh, May Day Mondays are dedicated to, to the memories of those firefighters. And uh, never, we said we would never forget. So we're going to try here at Mayday Mondays to, to keep that alive. Um, the, again, to catch up from last month, you guys that were with us last month, you remember that we we talked to we talked to a, to the chief from from uh, Boston. Get this picture up here. We talked to Chief Schaefer from Boston and uh, talked about. Um, his fire, the fire at the Back Bay fire that killed two firefighters uh, back in 2014. Um, that was a uh, firefighter, a uh, firefighter Kennedy and Lieutenant Walsh of the Boston Fire Department. Um, please go look at that podcast. Um, I know that uh, Chief Schaefer really uh, came on very courageous to come on and talk about that incident. He was the incident commander there. Um, and again, you know, no one, no one thinks that they're, they're going to go to a fire and uh, lose someone. And, and there was two firefighters lost there in, you know, what, what kind of appeared to be a bread and butter fire for, for Boston. So go back, please go back and look at that. Also, um, last month focused on emergency evacuation. Um, again, these skills that we're doing here at Mayday Monday are all, are all important skills. Um, none are more important than the other. But they're also stuff that we need to train on. No one wants to be the first time that they have to do an emergency evacuation to be at a fire where they have to emergency evacuate. Uh, we should be able, we should be prepared for these things um, and be able to, to uh, exit safely. But it's going to take training. Again, just like exterior water, no one wants to practice shooting water from the outside. No one wants to practice emergency escaping from a, from a fire. But if we don't, it definitely can impact when we do have to evacuate a fire. That was last month's, uh, again, from March of uh, the 2022 May Day Monday was about emergency evacuation. This month, we're gonna talk about uh, Kyle Wilson. Um, this is what you're gonna get with the, um, the May Day um, post, the May Day Monday post is uh, a talk about Kyle and about calling the May Day. Uh, this one, this one really hits uh, close to home for me. Um, when this fire happened back in uh, 2007, um, I was a assistant chief with the local volunteer fire department with my my volunteer fire department, which my house is about four miles from the scene of this incident. And my volunteer fire department, it was responsible for the area where this fire fire occurred. Uh, Monday through Friday at that time, Monday through Friday from 06 to 1800, the firehouse was staffed with, with career firefighters um, that took the calls while we were, you know, away at work and so on. And then volunteer at night and on weekends. 
um, it became a pretty close, a close group, right? As uh, those firefighters were there in the daytime, we would come in and take over. We got to know everybody. Um, as an assistant chief with, uh, with the Aquaquan Wood Bridge and Lorton Volunteer Fire Department, uh, we had three firehouses in a relatively big area of the county to take, to, to take responsibility of. I didn't get to get to know Kyle very well. Again, I saw him in passing as um, I spent more time at, at Company 2. But I, I definitely know the, the two guys that we're going to talk to today. I've seen them come in the fire department in Prince William. Also, uh, Dale City, our neighboring volunteer department. So um, I've been able to kind of watch their career, see where they've gone and, and where they're going to go and the good things that they've done in the fire service and will do. So uh, this one, again, uh, close close to home. I was at home the morning of this fire. And um, as the incident progressed, I was able to come in and help, um, help um, schedule staffing and backfilling while uh, these guys dealt with uh, the fire there and the incident. So with us today, we have uh, Jason Reese and Jason Trainum. Uh, both were uh, involved with Prince William County Department of Fire Rescue then, and um, Jason Reese is still still uh, uh, there. Are you still, a, are you a lieutenant or captain yet, Jason? Battalion chief now. Oh, wow. You got lots of promotions since uh, yep. I caught up with you. So with us is Battalion Chief Jason Reese and uh, Tech 2, he was a Tech 2, uh, Jason Trainum. Uh, Jason was also, Jason Trainum was also a volunteer with Dale City Fire Department. And we can talk about, uh, I have some stories about Jason, which I'm sure we'll get into. But um, if you would, guys, take a, take a couple minutes and introduce yourself to the crowd. Well, I'm Jason Trainum. I got 27 years in the fire service. As Tony was saying, I started out with the Dale City Volunteer Fire Department in 1994. I got hired with Prince William in 2001. Uh, 2018, I elected to step away from the fire service to take care of my own mental health. And uh, after I went through that process, I elected to get back into the fire service with the whole another department down south in Caroline County, uh, Virginia, which was a very eye-opening, great experience. Uh, I then decided to uh, totally change careers and I retired from the fire service and now I'm working as a behavioral health technician with adolescents but working with their substance abuse and mental health uh, uh, situations that they're going through. And um, I was uh, Kyle's uh, mentor slash field training officer the person who helped him with the transition from recruit school life to station life. Yeah, that's that's good. And it sounds like you really found a place uh, where you can you can you can be used there um, with the mental health stuff in these teens. Uh, yeah, it's really neat. Uh, my favorite thing about the fire service is teaching and uh, mentoring and everything else like that. I got a lot out of that over the years. And now uh, I can kind of carry that to a whole nother population, a whole nother dynamic. And uh, yeah, it's definitely a very, very, very re rewarding experience every day when I go there. Well, I can tell you there was one thing you weren't going to go into and that was construction. Because <laughs> I do remember, I do remember a, co a collapse class, a shoring class we did. And didn't you get that nickname lightning? <laughs> because you never struck struck twice in the same place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that was good though. I mean, definitely, we got to start somewhere. And, and again, <laughs> uh, stay out of stay out of construction. I don't think that you probably got a future in that. Yeah, definitely. Myself, my brother, definitely accident prone. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah I agree. <laughs> All right. Well, good, good. Thank you for coming. And uh, I really appreciate you. Um, I reached out to you, what was it, uh, last month and uh, set this thing up because uh, yeah, I yeah. knew if there's somebody I wanted to talk to about Kyle, I would go, I would come find you. So that, yeah. that's good. All Absolutely. right, Chief Reese. Thank you. Yep. Chief Reese. Yes, sir. Um, Jason Reese. I've been with the department since uh, 1999, um, 23 and a half years before that. I was volunteering in Maryland. Uh, for about five years while going through college and, and doing that kind of life. And that kind of got hooked on the fire bug then and came down here for the job and uh, 
worked my way all the way through. So now currently battalion chief in the third battalion and uh, trying to talk as much about Kyle and keep Kyle's uh, legacy and uh, memory alive, as well as uh, for this day as I was his uh, truck lieutenant. You know, I've been assigned at uh, Tower 12 at the time for about a year, year and a half before this. Um, so just like that, like you had spoken before, you know, you and I crossed paths multiple times, you know, shift changes and et cetera, et cetera, you know, so. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Is this your office here where you guys are? Yeah, we're in my office now. I figured it'd be the easiest uh, clean place to be. And like I said, he wanted to get together this morning and have some breakfast. And that's it. Uh, catch up, you know? Yes, sir. Good, good. Yeah, that that's a uh, Taj Mahal there you got. <laughs> it is a definitely a big station. <laughs> Definitely yeah, big well, it's definitely got full of full of career guys now, huh? Yes, sir. Yeah. Engine better. Yeah, that's one tower. thing. One thing we miss is a uh, career staff is the uh, tower staff at 12. Yeah. Um, I could you definitely uh, was good. Good stuff. Good times. Right. A lot of good, good relationships there between the volunteers yeah. and the career at 12. And um, it's it's definitely missed. Yeah. And we, we still have phenomenal relationship with you guys now with the, the OWL. Uh, team that's down there you know the two and 12 and all that so yeah no it's good it's and um I, you guys have definitely come a long way the the service has you guys have so it's it's good to see so let's talk about kyle so what i know about kyle right um he went to um they, he was born in maryland what, what brought him down to prince william do you know uh i know that his family moved here um and I think the early 80s, uh, right after he was born. I can't exactly remember what brought him down here, his parents down here, if it was work or uh, just the housing prices or anything like that. I would have to ask them. No, so he went to Hilton High School, right? I guess yeah. none of you guys, you guys weren't smart enough to go to Woodbridge High School. <laughs> um, that was the, uh, best high school east of the Mississippi. <laughs> So um, you went to Hilton High School, which was some upstart one right there. And what was that, about 2000, I guess? Yeah, yeah, it was 2000. I think the, the year he graduated was 2000. He went into George Mason for the, um, the athletic training uh, slash uh, uh, tourism major, I, yeah. I think it was. So he went to George Mason. He got a degree in athletic training mm -hmm. and then um, then decided to be a firefighter. What what got him into the fire department, you know? So it was his mom. His mom worked at the, uh, the hospital and she used to see us coming in and out of there all day, every day. And we used to have, we all had great relationships. Those of us on medic units. And uh, I think there was she this conversation. The yes. Yep. So there's always those conversations. And I think it just, Kind of just naturally evolved into that, you know. At least so he got into the department in two thousand six. Correct. Two thousand six. Yeah, he got to Station Twelve in June of two thousand six. So uh, he started recruit school either late two thousand five, early two thousand six. So he gets to Station Twelve. He's assigned to the engine there. Correct. And and who was was that where? Um, Tom was the was the officer there. Oh, during the the day of the fire, uh, it was my day off, and uh, Tom Lieutenant Tom Klimczak at the time, I'm not sure if he's been promoted since, uh, was filling in uh, for Chief or at the time Captain Hendricks. Okay, okay, yeah, I, I didn't remember if, if Kurt was there at that time, but he was the captain at twelve. Correct. And um, Tom was working, working, working overtime at, at Engine Twelve. I think he was a floater lieutenant. He was time. he was detailed in to cover that day. Um, there were some background things occurring with the, some grieving of a uh, transfers and stuff like that that didn't um, come to fruition in any way, shape, or form. But they it held up a lot of some transfers that were supposed to happen. So um, Lieutenant Klimczak was that was his this was his first fire after being promoted. Um, as a lieutenant, and he was it just kind of it was a holding pattern until some of that grievance went its way through. So he was put there because Chief Hendricks had been moved, but was still okay. kind of a station. It was kind of a weird kind of just mix right at the time. 
All right, so so Tom's working, and and uh, who else was on the engine? Kyle's Kyle was on the truck, but who was on the engine that day? Casey Hennessy and uh, Tom Arnado. Okay, it was Tom Arnado's first fire, and I think it was uh, Casey Hennessy's first fire uh, as a driver operator. Okay, and then the tower, uh, Chief, you were on the tower that day. Yes, sir. I was lieutenant on the tower with uh, that Tom used driving for me. Um, Sean Jones in the back rear outside bucket and then Kyle in the inside bucket. I got you. Got you. So you guys came on shift started at six. Correct. But you, I mean, you guys get there a little bit earlier than that. Yeah. I mean, it was just, it was standard pro practice for us to be there 10, 15 minutes, like have our gear ready 10, 15 minutes beforehand, you know, so that way yeah. shift change was, there was no, yeah, no lapse, so to speak. Yeah. You know? Yep. So this, this was like first thing in the morning. You guys were still checking out the rigs and stuff. Yeah. During the, uh, I always bring this up when I talk about Kyle and all this is um, just kind of how he is and how he was as a person is he was in the back checking his air pack out and never even heard dispatch happen. You know, the, uh, the tones went off, the computer went off and he saw, he turned and looked at me because he was, turned his air bottle on when dispatch happened. So the bell rang and he never heard it, but he saw me getting my pants on. Um, and uh, he was out of the rig fully dressed and back in the ring before I had my coat on. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was just, just, just like that. It's like, you know, Superman in a telephone booth. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's, it just, it, again, it's one of those stories that goes back to how he was, you know, only been a year on, but he had the abilities of guy been here 10, 15 years. Yeah. So he took pretty well to this. Oh, very well. Took very well. well. I mean, it, it had, it also had to do with, with the crew he was with too, right? Because depending on where you go, they could flounder or they could, they could prosper. So obviously you had some guys helping them. Oh, hundred percent. I mean, it, we had a, a great group of individuals there that we all, we all worked together. We all hung out together. It was, you know, a great firehouse life. If that makes sense, you know, in the, in the, the big scheme of it all is one of those things that we were a good group and we, we liked to mentor and help each other. So it was, it was all about making everybody better. Absolutely. And Kyle fell right in line. hundred percent. 100%. So, so was he still in probation at this time or he, he was out of probation? He was out of his probationary year. We do, a, you know, one year from the time you get out of recruit school, you have a, a quote probationary year. Um, and we have a probationary manual that goes with that. And that kind of helps guideline that probation. You know, you clear that book, it gets you a check mark to get off of the probation. But um, Kyle finished his in about, I think, four months. Um, yeah. He, he worked through it. He, he was that kid that, or, you know, and Jason can attest to it or, you know, even tell us. He, instead of waiting for us to give him the next thing, he just said, okay, what are we doing now? And just kept pushing the, the envelope with how fast we could move through it. You know, and we were all about proficiency, not speed. Yeah. And we wanted to, to get the, the knowledge right. Yeah, I have to say, uh, I had a lot of uh, technician ones come underneath me over the years and, Kyle's, I think, grade for an average on his written test when he got out of the fire academy is like 98.9. And he, it's, he was a true student of the job by far. Um, a lot of people ask, you know, why was he riding on a ladder truck that day? He was so young into the job. Well, that kid fought to ride that ladder truck. He learned that thing inside and out. Uh, that was a seat you had to earn. Uh, within the company, uh, by far, he um, actually, for a, a rookie year, he had some really good fires underneath his belt. Yeah, he got a lot of experience and stuff underneath of them, and his just ability to stay calm under pressure was very, very unique and something that. Um, was inspiring to me in a lot of different ways, even before the, the incident that happened. But uh, there's one funny story with his probationary year and his testing and stuff. We have a practical test and uh, uh, written tests and all that. But he, he had a steady you know, 100% average on his written test. And then he... All of a sudden, he comes up to me, you know, as Jason was saying, without even asking or for ahead of time. And he was very proactive of stuff. Uh, he wanted to take his hazmat operations written test. 
uh, that we had as far as probationary, man. I was like, Kyle, you might want to study for this one. You know, you've killed everything else. You might want to study for this one because this is difficult. You know, I even have a hard time with it. I was a hazmat tech. And um, he's like, no, I got it, man. I got it. So he goes and takes the test, brings it back to me. And I think he got like a 66 or something like that. He had a hard time on it. He was like, man, I don't think I should have taken that test quite yet. And I was like, yeah, you know, I, you should have listened to me. And uh, that I was like, we'll give you another shot. <laughs> so he had a, he got a chance to go study and go retake the test. So that's what probably brought his hunger down to 98.9. <laughs> so you think that that humbled him in, the, in his hazmat studies? <laughs> yeah, he wasn't a fan of hazmat. <laughs> All right, so now we don't want, we're not going to have engine 12 do construction or do hazmat. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. What else you got? I know you spent a lot of time with him, uh, Jason. Um, you got to have another good story for us. Well, uh, two real quick ones I'll give you. Uh, I talk about his ability to stay calm and project that onto other people, you know, when they're in stressful situations, we we're on a townhouse fire in Dumfries and we we're having a, a little bit of issue getting water to the hose. And we're in the side, uh, Charlie trying to get in through the basement. And finally we got the water you know, came to the line and we were ready to go in. And I, he could see that I was getting frustrated. I was like, I said to him, I was like, all right, everybody, let's go. This is what we're going to do. And he takes me by the collar. And he was like, Jason, you need to calm down. And it just brought me back into check. I mean, a guy six months on the job at that time, he was telling me to calm down. <laughs> so uh, his just ability to be a part of the team. And be, uh, if he was still here today, I definitely would see him being a station commander someplace because he had the ability to bring people together and lead them at such a, uh, a young point in his career. Uh, the other story I have is the picture that you have up right now, all the different little collage of Kyle. And the bottom right-hand corner uh, – is with him dancing with his sister and his brother. That's Kelly and uh, Chris Wilson. That night was the last night their family was all together. Uh, and I had a pleasure of being there because Kelly went to Africa as part of, of a study abroad type uh, thing that she was doing. And she was actually overseas when the incident happened. And on her way back, it's just the timeline. It just worked out. I think she was on her way back anyway. And uh, but that night is the night before she left, and that's up in Skinny Fats, uh, over in Fairfax, I think it was. And I was already down having dinner with my brother, and Kyle begged me to come out that night. And uh, I, I was coming back from Fredericksburg. He must have called me five or six times. He was like, come on, man, come on, hang out with us and everything else. Attention personnel, we have a visitor at the front door. <laughs> Sorry, interruption. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I was so tired from work throughout the week, but I was so grateful uh, that he forced me to come out that night because I was able to be a part of the evening where his family uh, – you know, was able to spend the, their last night together before, you know, his passing. And that might have been, a, you know, just a couple months beforehand. I mean, I can't remember how long Kelly was in Africa for. But uh, just seeing him dancing there brings back a lot. Uh, he definitely had some moves on the dance floor. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, he had a... Definitely a style about him, that's for sure. <laughs> he liked to go out. He liked to have fun. That's good. That's good. That's good. And it was a, a good one to have fun with, I guess, with, with you and, and the crew there from 12. Yeah, I mean, I can give you a, another story of, you know, kind of going from a, from a supervisor dealing with an employee. <laughs> and uh, 
as you know, in uh, here in the county, we're you know late to work has always been a a big trigger point with with uh, supervision and the problems and things like that. Well, attention personnel, um, we have a visitor at the front door. Kyle was late one day for work, and uh, so the typical you know make him call him, wake him up, tell him to come into work, and he gets into work, and you know typical twelve tradition at that time is we'd give you a clock because obviously you couldn't tell time and you had to carry the clock around. That was just what you did, you know, the, the way of kind of quasi punishing, but yet, you know, firehouse learning kind of thing happened. Well, instead he went and found a rope somewhere in the, the tool shed or something and uh, daisy chained it, attached the clock to the uh, daisy chain, put it around his neck and walked around like Flavor Flav for the rest of the day. But not only did he walk around like it, he talked like him the whole rest of the day. So for us, I think he turned it back on what we thought was going to be funny for him in yeah. you know typical fireman fashion. Yeah, you know? that's good. So, he punished you. Yeah, he made it worse on us. <laughs> yeah, he had a way of doing that. So <laughs> he could turn it right back around on you really quick. <laughs> that's good, and, and it's it's just so how this goes. I mean, um, I've done I've done a bunch of these Mayday Mondays, and it seems like. All of the people that we've we've, we've had the, the the honor to to talk about were were shining stars, right? Were were had had bright futures in the fire service. Unfortunately, they um, they they're not here to provide that 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 leadership. But in their in their in their honor, right? We're going to carry it on and make sure that we still get something from them and, and realize um, you know their their potential. Uh, even even after death, I hope. Sure. Here's um again in Prince William, we were um, lucky enough to to have a school, um, and again, it's just a minor token of appreciation, right? I mean, we should name every street after the guy, and personally, right? I, I want every every street named after a firefighter, but but um, you know, it was it was a it was a kind of a uphill battle, but. But uh, we do have, we do honor him with uh, naming an elementary school after him. And, and in the hallway painted on the wall is a, is a picture of a hero. And next to it is a definition of what a hero is. And um, I mean, nothing, can, this, is, this is a product of Prince William schools, right? That, that's, that's, it's not just a cool, right? It's cool, but it's not cool, right? I mean, in the same way. Yeah. We, we wish the guy would rather have him here than have a picture of him and have a school named after him. 100%. The family has really, um, at, at least I know, uh, they've really taken up that effort to firefighter safety, right, to, mm -hmm. to kind of get the message out and help us to, to continue to honor uh, Kyle and not let that, that memory let that memory fade away. Um, I know you guys have, have gone around, talked about this, and um, it's, it's good. It's good for all of us. Good for the fire service. I know it's good for you guys to to kind of realize that that to get that out and, and appreciate Kyle and what he did for you. Thank you. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, Prince William County. Uh, Prince William County, uh, at least again, I I am uh, born and bred there. I guess I shouldn't say I'm born and bred. I was actually born in. Andrews Air Force Base, and I moved down there in, in Prince William, moved to Woodbridge when I was two years old. So um, I, you know, was pretty much raised there. Uh, like I said, I went to, went to Rockledge Elementary School. I went to Ripon Middle School. I went to Woodbridge High School and, uh, and got into the volunteer fire department there when I was 15. Um, it's done so much for me, for my life, for my, uh, my career, my family everything. Um, so you know, Prince William County is home to me, specifically Eastern Prince William County and, and uh, the Route 1 corridor. You can see there I'm flying the flag of the best high school east of the Mississippi in uh, Woodbridge. Uh, some other things that, that Prince William's known for is, uh, unfortunately, right, we had like the largest, the number one tourist attraction in Virginia for a while was right. Potomac Mills Mall. Uh, again, kind of frustrating because there are some other things there. But um, that if that you may you may have known you may have heard about that. That's a little town there. That picture of Occoquan, pretty neat little town on the on the on the our little part of Potomac River, a little off there. But uh, that's there. Uh, there's other bedroom community, right? A big draw for Prince William was was after Interstate 95 was built, it became a destination for a lot of the federal workers who 
worked in DC and it wasn't too far away um, and it had cheap house and, and you had some land maybe uh, back then. That was probably the 60s and 70s. Like I said, when I moved there, we moved there in 69 and my parents bought the, the fourth house built in Lake Ridge, which is again, a bedroom community um, served by the Aquaquan Rivers and Lord Volunteer Fire Department. So that's what got me there. Um, Jason Tringham, uh, you guys, I know your family was uh, entrenched there in, in Dale City, right? Correct. Yeah, I grew up in Birchdale. Uh, my brother and I uh, both were Dale City volunteers, and uh, we both got hired in Prince William six months apart from each other. Uh, even though he's older, I was still able to call him rookie there for a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, I went to Garfield High School. <laughs> Bill Elementary and Godwin Middle School. So, yeah. Nice. Like, uh, yeah. Chief Reese, what brought you to, to Prince William? Actually, the job did. Um, I grew up military. My dad was military. Um, so I grew up all around the country. And then uh, my dad had been stationed at uh, Bethesda, the la his last uh, stop. When he retired, he moved down to Richmond, started working down at BCU at the uh, hospital down there. Um, but uh, I was in college and Graduated college from University of Maryland and uh, needed to uh, find a find a job, so yeah. started applying at a lot of different places. And this is one of the ones that uh, replied back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I didn't know maybe if you were part of that Buffalo train of. Uh, no, I ended up getting sucked into me and a lot of good friends were out of uh, the Buffalo train, but I wasn't actually part of. It. I think they just swooped it up, swooped me up coming down through Maryland. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it does seem to be an outpost for a lot of buff, a lot of that up, upper. New York, New York state people, huh? Right. Still is. Well, good. Uh, yeah. So Prince William, Prince William is, uh, what about 500,000 people in the County now? Yeah. I think a little over that somewhere in that. I'm not, not hundred percent on that number. So if you, if you're familiar with, again, there's a map of the Northern Virginia, Northern Virginia is, uh, um, kind of a part of a state in its own really. Right. Because the rest of Virginia doesn't want to claim us. I right. think that, you know, it's our fault that their taxes are up and that kind of stuff. But uh, Prince Northern Virginia up here, um, it's it's um, 95 Interstate 95 by uh, dissects the, the county down in, in, the, in the south southeast here. And then out here farther on the west is the Interstate 66 um, battlefields. There's a lot of historical Civil War battlefields on the west end of the county. Um, but that's where Prince William is stuck between uh, Fairfax County and Stafford and Falkir are, uh, are what surround us. And then to the to the east, you have Maryland. There's a, the Potomac River flows along that that line there. And that's what separates us from, um, from Maryland. Prince William County Fire Department. Let's talk about that. Uh, I know you guys have uh, just celebrated an anniversary, right? What was the anniversary? 60 years? or it's 60, yeah. So in existence for like 60 years, um, again, it was a, a bunch of bunch of volunteer departments that were in the county. Um, when I joined, we had uh, uh, three firehouses in um, Occoquan, Rivers and Lorton and Dale City had had I think they had three at that time. Right. Maybe, uh, yeah, I guess you had maybe you only had two when I joined. But Thank then uh, as the county grew. Again, with uh, being primarily volunteer, as that happens, right, so they need to supplement. Uh, some of the volunteers couldn't be there, so they had the career come in. So um, you can see they early on, they bought some some fire trucks. This was a great um, sea grave tiller truck that was that was bought. It was at uh, Station 2 for a little while and then moved to Station 12 uh, when they um, uh, expanded services there. Uh, so as it's grown... How many, um, you have staff in what, 20, 23, 22 firehouses? 22 firehouses, and we've got one that's in plans right now and two more to be built within the next five years. And, um, but last year, I guess, or the year before last, you went to, to fully staffed in we're every on, firehouse? We're coming up on, I think, two and a half years now, maybe you know, coming up on a third year of fully staffed every firehouse uh, career staffing in. Yeah, and to, to again to refresh everybody for uh, when when this fire happened, the um, county the, the county guys were there 
uh, primarily, right? Most of the staff was there Monday through Friday, 06 to 18. But there was 24 hour medic units in several firehouses. And uh, I guess that was it, right? Was there any, yeah. there was no other, other around the clock staffing? At the time of this, it was four medic units and engine 16 was a 24 hour engine. Yeah. Yeah. And now um, as time has gone, um, you're fully staffed. Every, every firehouse in the county has career staff 24 hours, Correct. seven days a week. Um, there are, what, 22, well, you have 22 engines. Yep. Uh, let's see. One, two, I think five ladder trucks, two heavy rescues. Uh, and that's 24 hours, much. yeah. Yes. And yeah. Medicaid so, much every um, yeah, so, so it's come a long way, right? What's yeah. the minimum staffing? Uh, engines are three, uh, ladder truck specialty pieces, four. Yeah, so uh, that's come a long way from from the from even even when when uh, the Kyle when the incident happened there and before that. Like I said, I know when I came on, uh, the, when I started volunteering, they were Monday through Friday, 07 to um, seventeen hundred. Right. Yeah, because it was seven to five. They were doing ten hour days, uh, five days a week, and um, then as um, Volunteers, as we couldn't keep up with the staffing, they went to 06 to 18. There was even a time where there was an 05 to 3, I think, and like a 9 to 7 overlap yeah. staffing with the career guys. Um, and then now it's to 24 hours. Yeah, uh, that's is that 26 there? Yeah, that's 26, yeah, that's 26. right? That's, uh, that was really like the first county county only firehouse built? First county built, yeah. And since then, we've got 22 and uh, redo of Station 6 and 4. Yeah, and we did 4 also, right? Yep, yep. 24, yeah, 24 was, was games on the fire off. Yeah, yeah, a lot. How many How many uh, career staff is there? We're uh, just over, like, I think we're about 720 or so, give or take. I don't know the exact number. 720 career yep. only, wow. Yeah, we've grown a lot since, like, even with this incident, I think in 2007, we were in that. Uh, mid 300s yeah 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 it, it definitely has blossomed over the last um decade right right uh, definitely no good good how many do you know how many about how many runs a county has uh, about forty two thousand. we ran last year just over yeah forty two thousand. and you got everything you got you got water we have boats we have uh uh heavy rescues trucks lat engines everything um, all over the, the county. Yep. No foam unit yet, right? No, but it's in the works. <laughs> is that right? It is in the works, yes. So with all the right, airport. Good, good. Let's talk about um, what's that? I'm sorry. I said with the airport and, the, and working with Manassas City, it's kind of uh, been a, a need to be there. It just hasn't quite come to fruition, but it's I know it's being worked and talked about. So. Yeah, I know uh, there's been a lot of, lot of, a lot of working together with Manassas now with, uh, with uh, their, their people coming to our, uh, to your, tr your training academy too, right? Yeah. I think they did one. They've done a couple of times here and there. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a, a an area thing there when it's coming together and now with a, a mutual response, right? You have the automatic, automatic dispatch to Fairfax. Yeah. And they, were to doing, they were doing the AVL. So everything's automatic. It's, there's no more borders anymore. Yeah. Yeah, but before they, it was just fire calls. Now it's everything. <laughs> yep. It's definitely kicking some uh, adjustment just to get yeah, used for to both. It. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I hear it. I, I can hear it. Uh, hear the dispatches, and they're they're coming in pretty often. And you guys, yeah, definitely going over there. Yeah. All right, good. Let's talk about uh, the fire. What um, April sixteenth? April sixteenth, two thousand seven. Yes, sir. Two thousand seven. Um, Typical, I mean, except for the wind, it was a typical kind of spring day. Yeah, it was. I remember driving in that morning, coming in 95, that the wind was blowing my car around a little bit, but at the time didn't put really two and two together. But other than that, it was just typical, relatively nice Virginia day. You know, it's, it's funny that you say that. Uh, last month, we talked to Chief Schaefer from Boston. Mm -hmm. And um, if you know about that fire, that was a wind impacted fire. 
as well. And um, he, re he even commented, he remembered being at a staff meeting downtown with several, several of the battalion chiefs. And he even commented about how the windows were rattling, right? It was an old building and the windows were rattling. And he was like, oh, it could be a bad day for a fire. And then a couple of hours later, he kind of lost track of that because of the building, right? Where he was sitting right. from the building, the wind was the wind was coming off of the river and hitting the back of the building. So he was kind of shielded from that. So it didn't factor into his decision making right away right. until right. right until uh, as fate would have it, things happen. Right. So uh, it's funny, and and that's one of the things, right? That we as as uh, as proud firefighters is we say that size up starts the morning we get out of bed. Right. Right. It doesn't just start at the time of the call. We take all that stuff in. So, yeah, that's that's important for uh, uh, it's the one takeaway that we can add to whatever we get out of this. So. All right. So it, it gets there. It shift change six o'clock. Everybody's coming in. Uh, yep. Sounds like a couple of detail people, like especially with um, Tom there. Or was he temporarily assigned it? Tom, Tom was um, he had been there the day before the shift before. So this was on Monday. He was there Friday. So he'd been there, was holding over. So he's technically a detail, but he'd spent most of his career in that firehouse already anyways, between 12 and two. So even though it was detail, he knew the, knew the, the layout very well, you know, um, and Tommy and I went to recruit school together, um, had known each other, good friends, you know, to this day. Um, so it wasn't like it was just a new guy out of nowhere coming into yeah, that, okay. that role. Um, but yeah, the okay, fire was so just he, he stepped right in like, like yep. part of the crew. hundred yeah. percent. Everybody's moving. Everybody's moving, getting, checking out everything. Yep. Well, like I said, up till uh, up till that point, he'd been the technician up at, at station two. So constantly training with each other, running fires with each other. It wasn't like he was a, a an unfamiliar face. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, I got it. I got it. Good. So six o'clock. Yep. The call was dispatched at what six oh three? Six oh three, yep. Yeah. So we just like I said, we were we were right in that middle of that checkout, you know, when you know that morning checkout, everybody's doing their their roles and getting their things together and uh like I said before, when he was checking his air pack, never even heard dispatch. Um, computer went off. I saw it, read it, yelled back to him. Obviously, I don't think he heard it, but or if he did hear it, again, he was dressed in and out before I was able to get fully geared up and um, out the door we went. Um, you know, six in the morning, multiple calls on it. You know, it was one of those going down the road. We had a real good inkling from the get-go that this was going to be a working fire. Um, originally dispatched to the wrong address. Okay. Um, what had happened is a civilian saw it from their house on the other side of uh, Marsh Overlook, which is a horseshoe street, uh, style street. So they they saw it, drove down, knocked on doors, drove back up. Of course, we only know this on you know hindsight after the uh, investigation, but uh, they called from that that point. So our actual address changed going down the road. We all know how that kind of plays with your mind going down the road when you have one game plan in mind and then all of a sudden it switches. So um, Tommy now, the one to thing, the one thing that you did have was this is this was a far run, yes, in twelves area, so so it, maybe you had a little bit of chance now to, to kind of recover from that, right? Correct, because yeah. uh, that is a that's a deep one. Yeah, it was, um, it's not the half, deepest, but it's definitely half, a, yeah. I think four and a half five minute response from the station, roughly. Um, yeah, and Tommy had time to adjust. We were able to adjust to the the right entrance into. There on the ladder truck is a lot easier for us because we could have gone any other way and been just fine. Um, Tommy talks about this a lot when we when we've talked about it is is uh, is a lesson learned. Stop trying to read addresses off of the flashing lights and try to read them off the map book. Um, says he actually went to lay out do his water supply instructions, gave the uh, wrong address um, because he was trying to read the the mailbox house numbers, not the what it should have been in the map book. Did it affect anything? I don't really think it did, but you know, in his mind, uh, I think there was some some doubt to it. You know, well, it's just, uh, it, it, that's and that's kind of one of the things you guys over the years. Again, me me being a part of the of the uh, organization over the years, the map books have have grown. Have mm -hmm. right? I mean, now with computers, it's probably uh, other other ways to get information. But that was one thing that I, I know you guys worked you know day and night. Yep. Um, on, on map books and, and they were down 
right? I mean, they were edit, they were updated all the time. Yep. And um, you definitely could you could count on the map the map book being right. Or if it wasn't right, if there was something that changed, uh, we could give it we could give it to you guys in the morning, and it would be it'd be fixed yep. within an hour. Yeah, so uh, yes, that's funny that that. Um, yeah, that he got he got kind of fixated on house addresses right. and then forgot about how good the map book is. Right. And we've all done it. I mean, we've all been in that position where you look out the window and it's give the give your numbers or give whatever off the front seat window sh shot of it, so to speak. You know, and that's we've all been there. Um, so they did the water supply instru or instructions. They dropped the line. We leapfrogged over them um, just to get the, the ladder truck in front of the building. And uh, as we were pulling up on scene. We got to like the AB corner. It was uh, eerily quiet, especially for six o'clock on a Monday morning in DC area. Normally the world is up and about and, you know, people everywhere um, kind of thing. There's again, nobody outside. The smoke was real heavy, just going straight across the street. So I actually had um, a driver pull short um, at the AB corner uh, because I couldn't see anything through there. And I didn't want him just driving blindly in through smoke, um, not knowing what was there. So we just pulled up a little bit short and then the uh, engine then leapfrogged us and parked basically right in front of that driveway. So you guys came in from this direction Correct. on the left, yep. came in that way. So uh, the picture at the bottom right is from what the guy that lived back here, right? Off yes. of um, this court. So his was a neighbor's house uh, before fire trucks were there. And you could see lots of involvement. This is the Charlie side, right? Um, yep. and, and there's fire from, from the ground uh, over the roof. Right. He, that's from that house up on the, on the, the one with the circle, the Marshall overlook, that house from the upper right, right there. Yep. Um, and the topography of that, that's about, a, I think it's like a 50 foot elevation from where that house is. So it's actually looking down onto the Marsh overlook house um, to give okay. a perspective. So the truck stops about about here, right? Yep, right at that AB corner. And yep. The engine, you say the engine stopped about here? Right in front of the driveway, just a little past okay. the driveway. Yep. Um, and go ahead. It's cars in the in the in the driveway. There was a car in the driveway, a car in the front of the house. Um, no one around, no neighbors talking, nobody neighbors out anywhere. There was there was like I said, eerily quiet. Um, nothing. To give any signs that there was anyone but the people in the house. Um, you know, it's one of those times in my career that I really felt that we were going to go in and be pulling somebody out or, or walking somebody out just for the fact that, you know, there was no signs that there weren't people inside that house at that point. Um, yeah. So we hopped yeah. out, um, had Kyle grab his, his gear and all that stuff at the time. Um, and this has changed since then, but our dispatch was uh, three engines, a ladder truck, and a rescue itself dispatch, and a battalion chief. Um, so either way we get there, it was acceptable for us to do our walk arounds or do what we call a split walk around. So Tommy got out and did a walk around um, the Alpha, Delta, and Charlie side. And I did the Alpha, Bravo, uh, Charlie side. Um, we both got down to the right. That's, back side of the house where the deck was, I couldn't get past the deck um, because there was a retention where you see the retention pond, there was a fence there. Um, so you know, very, I couldn't get past the heat and the, you know, that to get all the way around to the full side of side Charlie. Tommy saw me from that Bravo Charlie corner and we considered that a good enough and came back to the front. Um, Again, the topography of this is two, uh, two stories in the front, three in the rear. So I had that about 10, 15 foot uh, drop down. So when we were doing the walk around, we couldn't see the ridge line of the house. Um, so what we saw was the fire below the deck and on the top deck, the top of the deck, um, which appeared to be getting up into the eaves from what we could see. So I gave Tommy that information. And uh, with the fact that we had no, no signs of life outside of the house and the vehicles in the driveway and in front of the house, Tommy elected to uh, bang a second alarm to get the units uh, coming right away. Um, that told him once he got his hand line, we'd meet him at the front door. So uh, at the front door, we opened the door. It was unlocked, which is strange for a Woodbridge house. Um, so we opened the door. Um, Kyle and I walk in the front door and uh, 
the door slowly closed behind us, uh, real, real slow. We just stood in that front foyer. Uh, the smoke alarms weren't going off. The house was completely clear. Um, I equate it to looking at, when I looked out to the left-hand side where basically the Charlie side of the house, it looked like looking at uh, fire through an aquarium. Um, it just looked like it was, you know. So you say you went in the front door and it was clear. Yep. Yes, sir. Wow. I had, I had never, um, I, I, I had always assumed that when you got in there, you had fire uh, all in the back of that first floor. No, there was, you could see it. And like I said, it looked like it was in an aquarium. So to my, my mind, the way I read it is it was still on the outside of the structure and hadn't broken into the structure. Again, there was no smoke coming in there. Um, when we got upstairs, it's a little bit different. That was a big two-story foyer too, right? With this yes. with a stairwell that went kind of wrapping stairwell. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And on the left side was more like a sunroom type of uh, setup. So that's why looking outside, you can see like it looked like it was looking through an aquarium almost. It was kind of just the fire was there, but it didn't look clear, if it makes sense. Um, again, no smoke detectors, no lights on, nothing. Uh, we no started smoke yelling. detectors even? Wow. They weren't going off at the time, no. Um, or if, I, if they are, I don't remember them 15 years later, but I don't remember that. that it's one of those noises you hear and you get used to, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so waiting for the hand line to get in place. Um, I lean back to Kyle, have Kyle uh, open. He opens the door. And when he opened the door, Tommy and uh, Tom were both sitting at the uh, foyer with the, uh, they had a two and a half. They elected to pull a two and a half. Um, so I looked at Tommy. There was no verbals. There was no conversation. It was just the, hey, you know, I know. Head and I were good to go. Um, so I made the assumption that water was on its way and we were going to start working our way in. Um, again, with no signs of anything going on, we went up the stairs um, and had the idea that Tommy was going to be getting that line in behind us. So we get up to the top of the stairs, um, had a, it's a split hallway area, had down to the left was all completely black and to the right was a double French doors. I could still see it still pretty clear. Um, thermal imager didn't show anything on it that I can remember of, you know, sig heat signatures. So with the double French doors figured it was a, uh, master bedroom and went into the master bedroom. When we get into the master bedroom. Um, I go to the walk to the bed and there's nobody there. The bed's obviously been slept in. Um, I can tell you to this day that it was a white, white comforter with little red, uh, like small little rose petal type, you know, thing. So I showed you how clear I could see you make out completely yeah. that, um, but had smoke about say six inches from the ceiling, um, kind of a light grayish, you know, wasn't a whole lot of movement with it, but it was there still active. Big, so I, big vaulted ceiling um, in that. I think there are eight foot ceilings, maybe a little bit bigger. I can't remember to be honest, but I think there are at least eight foot. Um, do, you, is this the, do you think you were in the room over the garage at this point or not that, not that far yet. We're yeah. Cause that was the master bedroom was over that garage. So if you, the way, the way it walked in okay. it was the master bedroom, then it had a, it had a giant sitting area. So I mean, enough to put a full couch TV and all that. And then it had a walk-in closet and a full large bathroom. Um, so I got to the bed, started sweeping the bed, trying to look for it, looking above and below. And I asked, told Kyle to start searching off to the right of me. Um, when he got probably about 10 feet from me, everything went instantly black and hot. Um, super hot. Um, my ears started burning. I could feel my hands and my neck starting to burn. Um, I just fell straight to the floor and yelled to, uh, to Kyle to come back to me. And so we got to get out of here. There's probably some more choice words, to be honest with you, and what was actually said inside there, you know. Um, but we started to um, turn that way. I felt that Kyle was behind me because um, he had told me he was coming that way. And then by the time I had gone from standing to on the floor, everything from, from completely black to all orange. Um, everything was orange in every which direction, um, extremely hot, um, really not sure what way was left or right or up or down um, kind of thing. And for whatever reason, to this day, I'll never know what the answer or why I got this answer in my head, but there's flames that were moving sideways. And those flames moving sideways, for some reason, my head said that was a doorway or some way out. So I started going that way, um, work my way to the doorway and I got into the doorway. Um, there was a end table, decorative type table in the hallway. I ended up knocking it over and falling over it. 
uh, fell down the stairs, uh, hit my head in the, like that turning section of the stairwell, and then all the way down to the, the uh, landing uh, in front of the front door. Um, at that point, Tommy was on the front door. They had gotten blown back when this uh, flashover occurred. Um, and they were back there flowing water. He saw that I landed. Um, he saw where so I landed. You, hmm? Yep. They were in the foyer? They, they were right on the front of it. They hadn't actually gotten into the foyer. They were on that front stoop of the house, uh, flowing water in at that point. Um, they saw me land on the foyer, and uh, Tommy reached in, grabbed my uh, air pack strap, and just slid me out of the house. Um, and I landed at... Uh, now retired Captain Beltenfeld's uh, feet, who is the uh, rescue officer. I looked up and said, Kyle's still up there. We need to sound a mayday. And he sounded uh, the first mayday that was heard. Um, and then Kyle sounded his um, immediately afterwards. And to this day, I think Kyle's mayday is probably the best I've ever heard in any way, shape, or form or in a way a mayday is, should sound and way it should be, especially under those kind of circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, let's real quick. Let's get, um, let's get welcome. Welcome, uh, uh Bobby, uh, Halton to the, to the show. Um, uh, just get you caught up chief for we're on the scene here. Um, they, they've made a decision. They had cars in the driveway. So we are, um, actively, um, uh, aggressive search upstairs and then conditions change. Um, so at this point, right, we had at least a 25 mile an hour, um, consistent uh, wind right but there were gusts up to what like 40 miles an hour I think it was like 43 or 45 was where it was clocked at is the, the max for that day somewhere in that range it's been a while so yeah Just, where did you see the flames traveling horizontally i was on the floor in the master bedroom um there was a pair of uh like french doors for the master bedroom one of them was locked in position the other one was open we opened it to go into the bedroom. And it was coming through there. Like I said, I can't give you a, a reason why it made sense to me. It just, at that point, it was, it was a fight, you know, it was got to figure some way out of this place. And, you know, wow. All right. So, um, yes, uh, uh, Brian made a, a call, right? He yes, made sir. a mayday call to alert the incident commander. And Correct. then um, within seconds, Kyle issued a mayday call and um, right. yeah, I, I, you're right. It was, um, it had all of the, all of the, the components that, that were taught that we, that we focus on. Um, I mean, the kid was uh, uh, like you say, student and um, hadn't, hadn't been too long since he was in recruit school, but uh, you guys, um, you know, keeping him, keeping him focused on, on the job and stuff. I'm sure uh, this is something that you practiced and he was uh, ready to do um, while. And again, there's no there's no award for uh, Mayday calls, um, but uh, you're right. And, and that's one thing we're, we're going to focus on this month in our skill drill. But so so now um, the Mayday call goes out again. Um, it was kind of right. It was kind of quick. Uh, for the instant commander, at least I know listening to the radio traffic and talking to everybody, everybody got there kind of at the same time, right? Uh, right. The second new engine, the second new engine got there right about the same time. The incident commander, where was he coming from? 10? Um, I don't know where he was coming from at the time. The, uh, the battalion chiefs were, they kind of roamed. So they didn't have a home area or home base area. So he was coming into work. So he could have been anywhere. I don't know where uh, chief Forgo was coming from at the time. But I know that he has basically as he backed into the driveway across the street, we handed him the, the mayday. So, yeah. Um, it, yeah, listening to everything, you can see it kind of all happened right there within seconds, right? The, yeah. the decision to go in, you guys made, made radio traffic about that. Um, you get inside the radio traffic. Um, uh, Tom calls and says, get a second alarm. Um, you, you guys were going in and then um, he gets on the scene and then uh, 20 asked, right, didn't 20 ask for a fourth new engine because of a secondary water supply. Correct. So there's a lot of stuff going on. And then all of a sudden this hits. And now um, the chief has to kind of sort it out. So uh, he had, again, a, a great information on, on where, where Kyle was. Now right. it was just a matter of, of trying to get up there. And conditions were that bad. Yes. 
it, it went, yeah, it went bad real quick, real fast. You know, when that addict flashed and pushed down on top of us, it, it, it you know, it, it pushed Kyle back. Um, because I believe he was at the top of the stairs with him when we started that process. His halogen bar was found there, at the top of the stairs. Um, he ended up being his body and was found in back into the master bedroom, um, near the uh, like sitting area. Um, was that like about here, about where that, that, yeah, those two windows are? Yes, underneath that uh, window where your cursor is, but about probably 10 feet or so from it, 15 feet from it. In the middle of the room? Yes. Yeah, there's a, there a full couch in front of that window with a, a, a coffee table and a TV and all that kind of stuff. So there was you know, quite a bit of space in that bedroom. So now, now it turned into uh, a rescue effort, right? Correct. Um, the attack really attacked the building from every direction. Yes, we, I mean, the group of us at the front of the house and on the side out for that front entrance, that became the, the main focus point of go, trying to get in and trying to get back up to them. Um, at the same time, engine, I think it was engine 10 or maybe engine 20, I can't remember. It's when I took a line to side Charlie also and started doing some fire attack from that side of it. Um, but the crews, uh, we lost a lot of crew integrity in regards to who was trying to get in, but it was whoever was standing next in line went up the stairs. Um, so you had guys from the rescue and engine 12 um, trying to work their way up the stairs and just kept continually getting beat back by the time they get to the top of the stairs. Um, but it was one of those, that everyone would kept trying and trying and trying to get up there. Um, I don't even know the, the length of time to get up there, how long it took. Um, but it was over and over and over. I know it was multiple, you know, 15, 20 effort, you know, attempts at effort to get up there. And uh, it finally took uh, our safety officer and one of our second uh, due battalion chiefs to stand in front of the door to just stop it. And basically at this point was, you know, we were probably going to lose more if we didn't, if we kept on going the path we were going. Yeah. I mean, uh, again, if you look at the damage on that building, this was, um, this was on the first floor, right, um, in the dining room area, it looks like. Um, so there was fire on all levels of the house. Yeah, it ended up, um, the fire itself started in a, a pot underneath the deck, believed to be cigarette stuff. The fire marshal still hasn't determined it 100% because stories change or, you know, whatever it may be. But uh, it ended up underneath the deck and, and working its way up the outside of the deck. Um, but it also, there's a sliding glass door right there. If you look at the, that bottom right, um, where there's a real bulk of fire on the basement level, broke into that uh, sliding glass door. So you have fire underneath us when we walked in and fire above us or working around us. So that's the reason why that first and second floor were really clear. You know, of course, we only know this now from the NIST modeling and all that. You know, one, one interesting thing that, um, it, again, it, it had a second stairwell right correct it was another stairway that went from what the back of the house to the bedroom or yeah. that uh yeah, yeah and th those are always right another another avenue for for uh for heat and fire travel in these places uh right. but but it definitely had the fuel it needed with that exterior siding the the wood framing and everything uh to get up there 100 percent. hey uh, tony would you mind going back to the photo that showed the backside? And, and I had a question for Jason. One more. There we go. Okay. There we go. I got this. So as folks are... Oh, well, no. You want this one? <laughs> you had it. You want this one? No. No, no. You want this one? That's the oh. front. You nope. want this one. One had the left. There you go. Yeah, that one. Stop right there. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. Well, chiefs never take direction well. They just don't. <laughs> The, the hey, we're just glad you showed up. It showed up today. I, I I got a couple of things happening soon, so I had to take care of some things, like a like a warehouse lease. I had to take care of. So as I look at the photo, uh, Jason, um, you, you see uh, one of the support posts completely burnt out on that deck right yep. there. there. Was there more decking that has collapsed due to yes. fire there? So yes. that's really. That corner there, and on my screen, it just happens to be the right-hand side. Yep. Um, the right-hand side of the photo, where you see that one post just burnt out, the fire was so intense that that decking all collapsed. 
And yes. that's the origin area, right? Correct. So the way the house is laid out, as I'm looking at it, your, your fire path starts in somewhere in that region there in the far right hand mm -hmm. side of the photo. So it really makes sense when you start talking about with all the wind conditions, things I read about from the report, it kind of makes a lot of sense listening to you now, why you saw the fire behavior that you saw on that floor, because you had so much, you know, contained energy in there that that's a lot of energy. Yep. And, it had, it, it, and it's looking for a place to go like a Franklin stove. And so your, your description is amazing that you were able to, you know, process all of that and see all of that. And I think it really helps people to understand how, how complex and how dynamic and how fast these things happen. Um, Kyle makes the one Mayday transmission yes, sir. That, that we heard. Was there any indication beyond that that Kyle was doing or make it, making any uh, effort towards, uh, you know, getting out? I think so. I mean, there, was, there were marks on, on the walls and stuff like that. Um, like you said, his Halligan bar was found. He had a Halligan bar and a uh, six foot New York hook with him. Um, I like to think he was with me at that point at the top of the stairs because that Halligan bar was found at the top, you know, near the top of the stairs. So it didn't, it just didn't get there out of nowhere, right. you know? Right, right, right. Um, right. So because, because it's all conjecture, right? In the reports sure. that I've read, there's no conjecture. It's just what people found. Yeah, the report that was done, I mean, phenomenally well done report, but it was all done on you know, almost a police style investigation where if it wasn't verified by three sources, it didn't go in the report. Right. It was a Jack Webb, Joe Friday, just the facts kind of report, which is good, yep. which is really good because I hate when, when reports go into wild conjecture, you know right. what I mean? Yep. I, I think what Tony does for us and, and brilliantly so is he allows us to do what the military calls scenario planning, which is what, you know, what, what we hope people would do with these May Day Monday experiences mm -hmm. So that in listening to Jason, someone who was right there with Kyle at that moment of, you know, the fog of war and, 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 and just so much, so much going on around you that there's no, you know, people are fascinated. It's fascinating when people who have never been in situations like that hear our stories. It's like when you see the kid who watches the gunfight with the cops and they go, well, why didn't they just shoot the gun out of his hand? Right. <laughs> Because it's not a Western, you moron. You know, it's a, it's, it's real life, right? Correct. And so lots of times an experienced people will look at this and they'll say, oh, why didn't Kyle bail out the window? Or why didn't he do this? It's not as simple as it sounds. And the conditions are so debilitating. When you've got horizontal fire spread, at, at, the temperatures have to be so intense and the conditions in there have to be so uh, energy fed that the fact that you're alive is a miracle. It, it's literally a miracle. And the fact that Kyle was able to get out of May Day and move is, is just, look at the, um, uh, the DC fire, uh, Cherry Road. Cherry Road, yeah. Look at that. L look at, the, look at the, uh, um, the, um, the Oklahoma City fire, uh, where the, the fire dropped down out of that closet area from that rain roof operation. In those seconds, firefighters died, men and women died, and 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 here again we see that you know, but I think there's tremendous um, honor and and respect to your organization for the amount of training that Kyle had at that point in his career to perform under those circumstances to that level of excellence. That is one of the takeaways for me. That when people say, you know, why are we doing saving your own and drilling at the speed of flashover in recruit school? Because Jason is alive. That's why we do it. That Kyle had the best chance ever to get rescued or to rescue himself because of that training. And, and, and I really believe that. When you, when you tell me he's carrying a Halligan and a New York hook, two mm -hmm. hands, two tools, you know, he's not... You know, he's just not running up there like you know, Heather and Naw. Right. This young man was prepared. He was focused. He was disciplined. Um, all of you were. I mean, it's a 
it's a it's a tragic fire, you know, for obvious reasons, but it's also an amazingly instructive fire. And as we look at these conditions, one of the things I think that our brothers and sisters in the Boston, Chicago, Baltimore area should be thinking about are all of those wood frame out stairwells that, that they have and, and porches uh, and those two deckers and three deckers throughout their cities. That avenue spread, those outside in fires are so fascinating, right? Because right. the way I read this fire and, and correct me guys, if I'm misinterpreting <laughs> my study, the outside in fire came up, caught the decking, the decking then caught the soffit. The soffit then put it into the, uh, the void space above the residence, above the home. That's why you see that flame travel all the way over to the roof is burnt out almost top to bottom in this photo. Probably was pretty close to when y'all got there. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about this particular building that's really instructive and, 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 and also, I apologize, but thank you for being here. I mean, God, God bless you for having courage and strength to do this. Those multiple pitched rooms that we're, we're building today, and, and they're more and more common for aesthetic reasons, and God bless them. I think buildings should be beautiful. I think there's nothing uglier than the ugly building. The <laughs> building buildings should inspire us, right? So even in homes, I like those multiple pitches, but they provide incredible void spaces for gases to build up and create incredible energy, which is what you experienced on that second floor. And, and uh, so I just wanted to point that out to folks as they look at it. There was a whole nother section of deck over there. That's what's gone. And, and that's what fed that fire so intensely. And when you think about how those decks are constructed, you know, treated in flammable uh, coverings, dr very dry wood, you know, separated just perfectly like you would for kindling, right? I mean, if you wanted to start a fire, that's how you should do it. And then, you know, cooking underneath them, barbecue things underneath them, just don't do that. I mean, when we're out doing our, our pub ed stuff, we should look at those structures and we should say, hey, move this grill away from it. Whatever you do, don't grill under this decking. Don't, don't leave a, 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 you know, don't, even if the weather's inclement, don't do it. You know what I mean? Sure. It, but you know what we also need to do though, and this is this is what's probably so frustrating, is why wasn't this big ass house sprinkler? Right? I mean, did they not again? I, I know the homeowner didn't have a choice. It wasn't part of the uh it wasn't one of the options on the list, sprinklers, right? And and in Virginia, they're not required. I, up the road, DC, they required on all new construction. But Prince George's County, Maryland, Maryland requires is requires it on all new construction. And again, there's still there's still big fires. It's not like it's gonna complete, it's gonna prevent every fire. But imagine what this what it would have done here. Right? I mean, again, that's what's I guess that's what's the frustrating part. And you talk about, you know, go to pub eds and tell them don't grill. Well go to pub eds and tell them to tell their parents to call the senators and get them to put sprinklers in the buildings too. You're not I mean, completely against that. I, that's I, a whole I, nother that's a whole nother show, Bob. A whole nother discussion. And I'd love to have it with you. Sometime. We can talk all for months on that. <laughs> yeah, I don't think coercion is ever the way to go. Ever. And and with all the existing inventory, good luck. Because there's a couple of houses around already that don't have them. And, and full disclosure, I don't have them. And I've got a big ass house. Do you have them? No, I don't have them. And, 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 and but, but, you know, I, yes. And, and uh, it wasn't an option. It, it is going to be an option on the next one, hopefully. And I don't, so, and I never want to go to the coercion stuff where you get some rich elitist, like um, no disrespect, I'll throw Mitt Romney under the bus because he's a hedge fund billionaire who will say every house in Utah has to be sprinkled because it wouldn't hurt him. But if you're a first-time homeowner and you're making $35,000 a year in freaking Salt Lake City, now you're screwed. So I, I, until we, you know, and I'll just stop there. But mm -hmm. great point, Tony. Maybe And if you can afford sprinklers, God bless you, do it. I've only been in one sprinkler at home my entire life, and that was Alan Bernacini's. That was it. And, 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 and it was a retrofit. So that's the only one I've ever been in. And, and. So I think when we look at existing stock though, to go back to my point, you know, we can make an impact there. And I think too, all too often we discount, you know, when we do go into homes for various reasons, whether it's, you know, a smoke alarm, whether it's, you know, just do, doing what we do, it's a chance to tell people about things like this, that 
could make a difference because it's just by the grace of God, the family wasn't, you know, completely lost. You know what I mean? It's, it's really a miracle. Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, they had a guy that saw the call the fire and came around. Hole up there. Is that, is that your elbow hole there, Jason? What was that? Yes. Right there. Is yep. it really? Yep. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Like said, All right. So trip, tripped so, over uh, that, that table or however fell over, stumbled over it and just into the wall and then down the, and Jason, just just to clarify for our, our folks who are listening, mm -hmm. how was you, how were you wearing your gear? Fully buttoned up. And your chin strap? Chin strap down, head fl or ear flaps down. You know. Yeah. Amen. And, so, and you know, and, and, people need to hear that. If you're going to wear your gear, wear it correctly. You know, the scene out of backdraft where the Baldwin characters getting dressed up by the other character. That's a you can do that in the rig. Look at the rookie and, and you know make sure he's wearing or she's wearing their gear correctly. When you, you bring up a point that you know I didn't talk about going down the road to this fire, but um this kind of fits that same mold a little bit in regards to uh radios. It was uh the night before they um the volunteers had a brush fire and so they grabbed a, an extra radio off they grabbed the inside bucket radio off the tower to go on the brush fire with it and it never got moved back unbeknownst to us and uh going down the road sean jones or kyle said something to sean about not having a radio and sean who was the outside bucket took his radio and slid it across the doghouse to him so that kyle had a radio so there was a point that literally kyle may have not even had a radio um you know just by pure happenstance you know um so phenomenal thinking by two relatively young guys to, to you a, know. A, another good training point, Jason, and thank you for bringing that up. Keying a radio in, in a life or death situation and making a radio transmit, it, it sounds really easy, but fine motor skills, those are the first things that go. They sure. really are. <laughs> I, I, I've, I've spoken with men and women who survived events like yours, and they said turning the doorknob was a challenge. They couldn't, you know, they just couldn't deal with it. It was like the hardest thing they'd ever done. And I'm like, wow. Well, if you looked at my glove after the event outside, it was hard as a rock. It had baked so badly that I couldn't move fingers within the glove itself. Um, but again, I mean, so that goes to that the point of being, you know, the fine motor skills, you know. So uh, back to the thing, we, we talk about uh, several, several, um, uh attempts to get up those steps correct uh, crews even came in off off of the deck and tried to get up to get up from that direction yeah, uh, i know that there were some that went up the other set of stairwell stairway the other stairway that was in the back of the house which right. took them into a different direction it didn't take them to where where uh, they believed kyle was at the time right so finally what what uh what some units from the second alarm right were able to to get up there mm -hmm. and located Kyle. Correct. All right. So um, they find Kyle. Kyle was uh, not in a, uh, it wasn't savable. Correct. At that point. Um, and then it became, it turned into um, an investigation, right? Uh, investigation yep. incident um, after the fire was extinguished. Mm -hmm. With, what point did you find the homeowners? Um, the homeowners actually came out right after the May Day occurred and talked to engine 10's driver and said, hey, we're all out of the house uh, to them. Um, they were so next door or they, they were in the yeah, car? That there was a, the individual who called it in was a, a military guy, was up for work, saw it, drove all the way around, knocked on the door, got them out. They went to the neighbor's house. He got back in his truck and left. Um, so he wasn't even on scene in any way, shape or form when we got there. Um, and then the homeowners were in the neighbor's house again, never came out until we were well past, you know, the third engine was basically on scene when, um, they let anyone know. So at that point it was way past too late. Jason Trainum, uh, you, uh, were there about this time? Yeah, I got a call about 15, 20 minutes into the fire. I was at home. I live a mile away from the fire and uh, I got a call from a coworker saying that there was a fire on my first due and uh, 
that my rookie was trapped. And at that time, Kyle was basically off his rookie year. He completed his manual. I didn't even, his name wasn't even in the back of my head. I thought it was the other guy uh, that was just in the field for four months as his very first fire, Tom Onrata. Um, so uh, when I got that phone call, it's a lot to process right when you're in a dead sleep. Somebody calling saying, you, this is going on. And my first thing I did was call my father and I, who's uh, who was an Arlington, Arlington County firefighter, now a retired DC police officer. But, and I, he's had similar situations throughout his career. And I was like, I don't know what to do. I can't go down there. I don't want to be an accountability thing. I feel I'm, I don't know what to do. And, and uh, at that time I was, but the information I received on the phone call, I was pretty sure someone had passed um, and somebody didn't get out just by the way the phone call was going. And I told my dad, I was like, I don't know how, what to do. I don't know how to control my emotions. He was like, Jason, screw your emotions. You know what you need to do. So I immediately got in my car, drove you know, less than a mile to the street and just sat there in my vehicle and watched the fire activity go on. Uh, sat there for an undetermined amount of time. And um, Bob Newman, who was OWL's maintenance guy, lived on the same street. And I saw him walking up the hill. So I, I think at that point in time, um, I got on my vehicle, I went up to Bob and I asked him, I was like, man, what is going on? Cause you know, I had a zillion things running through my head at that point in time. And I was not prepared to hear the name I was about to hear. Um, so, and he said, Jason, it's not good. Uh, I said, who is it? And he said, it's Kyle. And I said, is he gone? He's like, yeah, he's gone. So at that point in time, uh, Bob, I, I, I remember my legs. I'm, it was probably the, some of the worst pain I ever felt in my body, the grief that just overcame me. Uh, but Bob was able to walk me down to the uh, neighboring house where all the, the crews, I guess, were sought refuge to after the fact in the garage when the neighboring houses and I walked up and I saw my one rookie you, you see the back of his jacket there Tom Arnado and he was the first person I saw in the garage and like I said he's only four or five months out of recruit school at that time you know never been on a fire but you know how people that have been in the battle, they have that look, like they, they've been there. They have that look in the eye. Tom was very green uh, before that day. He had the, the look of um, a very fresh new guy. When I looked into his eyes, his eyes were the first thing I saw in that garage and it looked like he just went through 30 years of war. And I knew then that to, that was going to be a day that was going to change all our lives forever. Uh, I was very grateful to the person who did call me and tell me what was going on uh, because Kyle, I mean, very quickly became one of my best friends. Uh, I was his mentor, his field training officer, his tech two, but he was my brother. He was my friend. And for me to get that phone call is the best worst phone call of my life because being a part of the honor and tradition of bringing him home was probably, it's, it's one of the most special things I'll ever carry with me. I don't want every, anybody to ever have to feel it, but I was very honored to be there, to be a part of it with these guys. Very, um, very difficult time for a kid with such short time in the fire service. He found a way to become a, a part of the, the family. Yeah. Uh, 
just so so the recovery after yeah. the fire after the fire um how did you guys obviously took took some time off um focused on 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 recovery and moving moving on uh what was one of the first things uh the fire department did to to address the was there was there um uh, services that they, they provide um, psychological counseling, things like that for, for members. Um, they did, but it took a little while to get some of that. I mean, we have a phenomenal resource with uh, Vicki Taylor here in the County who does a lot with the national fallen firefighters um, was the head of our, um, you know, CSB for a while. And now is in charge of the department's um, behavioral health uh, section within fire and rescue now, but um so we had a phenomenal resource right here in our own backyard, um, but it took a little while for that to really manifest itself out. Um, the day after the day of the fire, they, they we, like I said, we originally got put down into a, a the garage. Uh, one of the neighbors opened up the garage and gave us some waters and all that. And somewhere in the middle of this, a cell phone came out and a lot of us started making phone calls um, to our loved ones and all that. And, uh, and I don't know if you remember this or not, but this is the same day as the Virginia Tech shooting. Um, so there was a lot of, uh, media that got pushed down from this to go to the Virginia tech stuff. Um, so we made some phone calls to our wives and all that kind of stuff. And I told my uh, wife, I've been married a month at this point. I got married March 3rd of 2007. Um, so I called my wife and told her, I said, I think I'm okay, but I'm gonna have to go to the hospital and really didn't know much more after that, you know? Um, so she ended up coming up to the hospital, meeting me at the hospital, um, and then eventually ended up in the burn unit for a little bit, you know, as, a, as an outpatient uh, kind of thing. But so they took us from there. They got us onto a bus and the bus took us to station two, actually, uh, where we started the process of, you know, we had we couldn't leave unless we wrote um, some kind of witness, you know, witness statement, which, you know, in hindsight was horrible to write. I don't even know to this day what I wrote, um, but, you know, it obviously has to get done from a. The investigation side of things um and at that point we were told you could go home um so i think we were just kind of left you know i went to the hospital and those guys they all kind of did their thing um we were told from the department you can do whatever it is you know if you want to take a week off two weeks off a month off there was there's was no end or no um they didn't give us a target date you had to be back by they said do what you got to do um so to speak and uh so like I said, the next shift, everybody came back. Um, Tommy Klimzak slid over from the engine officer spot to my spot because I was out on light duty now for the burns. So he was now taking, you know, now driving or being the officer of Tower 12 while I was out. Um, I came in um, in between doctor's appointments and that kind of stuff because I just had to be at the firehouse. I couldn't, sitting home by myself was, was not a good thing um, because I immediately went to, just dark places. Um, just, it was just, it was not a, a place to be, you know? Um, and so it didn't take long. I mean, I, I think, I think the first two days after Kyle's death, Woodbridge, you know, station 12, station two, they didn't run a call, which is, as you know, is completely unheard of, you know, in a station that normally runs 15 calls a day. Um, so it, it was kind of eerily all throughout the County in, in regards to that kind of stuff. Um, but then I know you have one of the pictures of, uh, tower 12, um, the volunteers, you guys did a phenomenal job of cleaning that rig up and, uh, making it a memorial within the firehouse. And, uh, they, uh, the department felt that the need of having, um, everybody get a chance to come through and see us and talk to us. So they rotated, um, all the, all the units through the firehouse, which, um, in hindsight was not a real good thing. That was hard. Um, because as you expect, every every time a new engine or new unit showed up, the first questions they were having was, well, what happened? And wanted us to tell the whole story again. Um, so it hurt us, you know, from a constantly ripping the Band-Aid off uh, perspective for there, but it made the first units that were there even tighter bond. You know, we I equated it to, uh, a circle in the wagons when the Indians were attacking. Um, and that's kind of how we treated it is they were the Indians, anyone coming in, you know, 
and we were our own own little group and nobody else was coming into our group um, so that that mentality i think also eventually hurt us for a while because we all just did our own things together um which always as in we all know with firemen it turned to alcohol or turned to to things that were available to us to, to self cope or self medicate. Um, and then Vicki Taylor started keeping working with our department. Eventually, I want to say it was six months. I don't really know the timeline. Um, had three guys from FDNY come down um, that had been in our shoes in regards to a line of duty death. And uh, we all sat in a room and just got to talk. Um, and that, that kind of started to normalize some of the feelings we were having. Um, and those that helped get us moving at the same time, uh, Chief McGee at the time that, um, had become the chief and he would go to dinner with us. He would take the engine officer or the, all the officers of that are there and we'd all go to dinner. Um, and we just sit and talk and, um, there was a lot of, a lot of good came out of that. Just sitting there, especially with the FDNY guys to normalize our feelings, but with Chief McGee having the ability to, Hey, this is what we're seeing. This is what we're feeling. This is what the troops are saying, you know, directly to the chief of the department with un, completely unfiltered. Um, Cause I can tell you, there's a lot of things that were said um, that you would never say any other time to a chief of the department um, because we were hurting so bad. We didn't know how else to express it or say it. Um, so that worked our way through. And that's kind of where I mean, it eventually led to um, us, you know, the day of the report um, coming out. For me, it took you know, my wife and I hitting complete rock bottom, you know, and her, you know, because we're hard headed firemen. We're not real smart. We're not good with our emotions. Um, it took, you know, her coming with a two by four saying, I'm leaving, you know, if you don't get your act together. And uh, that the day of the report, I remember really, I walked up to Vicki Taylor and said, I need help. And she walked me right over to the person I'd be seeing from that point on. Um, and we both said, you know, counseling myself as well as couples counseling um again i'm, I'm not going to dive into all this we don't have 12 hours or if longer to do this but uh you know i'll bring up one story of, of this because just because it, it really changed the path of, of my marriage in regards to actually making it work is uh, my wife and i started doing couples counseling and one of the first conversations we had with her is you know you know you're young you just got married do not have children right now I'm like okay we won't do that, you know, kind of thing. So my wife and I did a impromptu um, Valentine's Day trip to Vegas. And what happens in Vegas did not stay in Vegas. <laughs> um, so nine months later, I had my oldest son. Um, but that gave us something to fight for versus just walking away from it. Um, and to this day, you know, married 15 years and three kids. So uh, I'm not going to say it's a perfect marriage because that'd be lying. But uh, it's got us keeping the fight. Well, personally, I'm glad that you did that. And Jason, there, I've been married for 48 years. There are no perfect marriages. No such thing, right? <laughs> none, none at all. And you also raised another really interesting training point for those of you who are listening. Always tell people what you want them to do. Never tell people what you don't want them to do. Because if you right. think about it, the word no has no meaning. In other words, don't touch the stove. And what's the first thing you do? You touch the stove. Don't, you know, don't, don't get pregnant. Okay. What's in your head? (laughs) Getting pregnant. I'll show you. (laughs) Yeah. Right. I'll show you. Right. But but I just mean, it puts a, we think in pictures and there's no picture for, you know, zero negative. No, you know what I mean? So there's just the picture. So, and I'm not saying that's what happened. I think your wife was probably, well, I can say this, Clearly, because people can see you, your wife is probably much better looking than you are. One hundred percent. I married up. There's no doubt. Right, right. Every every firefighter I know is batting out of their or fighting out of their weight class, right? Um, it, which is remarkable. I think the the guys and gals that we marry see in us things that we don't see in ourselves. Certainly, they don't marry us for our physical attributes. But I think that what you said there is so important because you know you cannot. There's no way to not bring home something like this. In other words, you can't leave this at work. I mean, this is your friend. This is your, you know, this is a kid. You, you know, the, you love Kyle. He was a man that you, you know, 
felt very strongly about. There's no way to leave either of you. You can't. This is something that you've got to you've got to talk through with your whole family, and and when it happens, and and that's okay. You know, I uh, had the pleasure of speaking with Dan DeGrice today, who's probably the guy I always reference first when it comes to these kinds of issues. But these are the events early on in my career. They started what was called critical incident stress debriefing mm -hmm. with Dr. Mitchell stuff, and there was some there was some pros and cons and. Not, not every call requires that everybody sits down and, you know, has a, a real checkup. These do, you, you know, you, you're on scene and you lose a fellow firefighter, please don't, don't try to play Iron Man. Not, not in this, you know, you're not Captain America, not, not you know, get help, talk to somebody. You're right. But it's also, there's a fine delicate balance to it all too, because you, immediately afterwards you're not ready to talk yeah. you know you're not in a position to talk you know you're still trying to just figure out which way is up and down yeah. um so there, there comes a certain time and obviously for each person it's different you know you're never going to know exactly when the right time to talk about it is and you know unfortunately we as a, a service usually need to hit rock bottom before we get ourselves back up um which just like you talked about you know the, the cism the you know, peer support stuff and the, all the mental health stuff is extremely vital um, for these events. It's just there. And, and one of the things our department did, which in hindsight, you know, is phenomenal, is they took one of our retired battalion chiefs, um, guy by the name of uh, Chief Davis, and he would just show up where Tommy and I were working. He'd just show up and sit down, firehouse, have a conversation. Um, and they'd be gone 15, 20 minutes, you know, kind of thing. But it was, you know, for us, we didn't really realize what it was, but the reality of it was, was there's somebody looking out for us, you know, um, kind of thing. The and technical term, the vital. technical term for survivors and folks that go through the called second victims is the terminology that they're using, uh, in, in mental health these days. And basically it's everybody surrounding the, 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 the person who Kyle, everybody, mm -hmm. whether it was the dispatchers or the, you know, the mutual aid companies or, you know, fellow firefighters who were down the block, who should, or even just folks who worked with them or knew him, or, you know, those are, those are called second victims and, and every event has them, you know, and, and we always focus as firefighters on, you know, the person we did the CPR on or the person we, you know, extricated from the car. But sometimes it's good to think about, the envelope that surrounds that person, you know, sometimes thousands of people, but in most cases, at least hundreds of people that, that are touched by that person routinely. And in, yeah. And, and, and for Kyle, it was your entire organization, right. all the, all the, all the men and women who went through training with him, all the men and women who trained him and served with him. And, and, and now with your courage and, and your perseverance, you're, you're continuing to honor his his sacrifice and his his life by doing things like this and sharing lessons and being open about hey you know I, I didn't handle it well until I got until I got help you right. know and 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 your organization is to be credited with the way they handled it also I, I I was not being dismissive about the report that was a that's the way a report should be you know it didn't it didn't cast aspersions or you know say shoulda woulda coulda it just basically said, this is what we know happened as best we could put it together. And, and that's what a report should do, right? You, you can conjecture all you want, you know, that's, you know, but, but a, a good report, that was a good report. It, it's a great organization. And I, I just want to thank you guys for sharing the whole story, you know, not, not pieces of it, but the whole story. Well, I, know, I know one of those, um, those other victims who wasn't there, but was probably wishes he could, change places with Kyle is uh, Jason Trano. And uh, Jason, I know um, this is this was tough on you. And and um, like you said, change your life. Um, I hope that um, that that you've, you know, you've come to grips with with what happened and um, you know, have have uh, have made have become better for, for, for this. Yeah, absolutely. I, I had a pretty dark spot uh, immediately after the fire. I went into protection mode with the other guys 
all the rest of my uh, guys on the engine of the truck, everything else, I was more worried about them. I never did any of that really self-check to say, hey, I'm okay, and like, or ask myself, am I okay? It's not the day of the fire. It's not the day after the fire. It's the weeks, years, you know, after the fire where you really need to check yourself or any big major traumatic life event. Uh, one of the things that Jason was talking about, a lot of us turned to alcohol. I mean, that was the one way we coped. We all went out drinking almost every single night. Uh, eventually, other guys moved on. They were able to make peace with it. And I was st uh, stuck there and like frozen in time. Uh, eventually, uh, I thought what I was going through was normal behavior. I never drank every day. Uh, I didn't do anything like that, but I had to get my brain to calm down at times. And I binged. And one day uh, I literally woke up in the hospital because I drank too much. And uh, I was like, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I need to get some help. And throughout that process, I got hooked up with what I now, everybody that knows me and Kyle used to make fun of me all the time. I love NASCAR. For so many years, I was running my race by myself, right? I didn't have a pit crew. <laughs> I wanted to handle everything by myself. Well, eventually I was, you know, running, on, running my race and I would go into the pits and my pit crew wouldn't be there, but I see another car come in, right? That needed to have work on it. So I'd forget about my car and go work on their car. Then eventually I'd be done helping them out, get back to my car, and eventually my car broke down. Well, now that when my car broke down, that's when I woke up in the hospital. Uh, now, uh, when I woke up and said, hey, I need help, I'm sick, uh, all of a sudden I started establishing my pit crew. I have people now that I can call on for any type of situation I get into, whether it be uh, – uh, thinking about Kyle, I need to talk to somebody about that. I feel free about sharing my feelings or just a life situation where I don't shut down. I have doctors, therapists, friends, church members, anybody I can reach out to for any type of situation that it, when my car needs to get into that pit stop, I got, I got a whole team of uh, people to help. Uh, Kyle had just such a profound impact on my life but he his passing was just a small uh, part of my whole mental health journey I started when I in 1994 when I was 16 years old my brain was still developing you know I saw some bad stuff at 16 years old then you take in the Christmas fire in Dale City and so on and so forth a lot of trauma compounded without the appropriate therapy I got myself in a very dark spot. Well, I'm happy to say now I'm almost five years sober. Uh, I got an excellent team of individuals that help keep me that way. It's very hard work, but I'm living testament. You can get help. You can get better. There's hope out there. And now, you know, since I elected to, you know, retire from the fire department, I'm giving back, uh, by working at a behavioral health hospital with uh, teenagers with uh, mental health and substance use issues. So it's come full circle uh, for those out there that are feeling like there is no help. I can't do it, you know, or I'm not sick. You know, just really take that time to, you know, raise your hand. I need help. People will come running. So. Yeah, no, I'm glad to see. Um, I'm glad that I reached out to you and 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 see that you're thriving. You're you're doing good stuff, and uh, still still giving back, still serving others, which um, says a lot about about your recovery and where you are. And uh, Jason, Chief Reese, thank you, thank you so much. I like to 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 bound these things with uh, you guys that were a part of this to kind of if you if you have three things, two or three things that you think. You want your the people that watch this to get out of our uh, of our time, and the incident and and Kyle and sure. Um, 
the first one I wrote down, and I think when we, like I said, Jason and I went and had breakfast this morning, the first thing is uh, the mental health of things. Take care of yourself. Um, you've got to take care of yourself because you can't help others if you're not taking care of yourself in some way. Um, but that also goes to your crews. Um, the biggest thing I found is throughout all this mental health side of things, I never saw the problems within myself. You know, all anything that was going on, although there were glaring signs everywhere, it took somebody else to tell me that this was happening. Um, and so I've always talked, you know, I teach this in our lab classes and our, our, our um, leadership classes is you've got to have the ability to look at the people you work with and have the intestinal fortitude to say, hey, you're doing OK and not just not mean it. You know, so if something is going on, it's not a simple passing of going, hey, you're doing all right. No, hey, I mean, I've noticed this. Are you really OK? Um, because they may not realize it or see it. And we all go through our struggles. We all have them. If you've been on this job more than six weeks, you've you've seen something that's, you know, that may trigger something. So for me, the biggest thing is, you know, do the things to help take care of yourself. If it's therapy, go to therapy. It, it's amazing how um, enjoyable therapy can become, to be honest with you. Um, it's, it's kind of a weird thing to be able to go into some stranger and just unload information that you've been bottled up. Um, so that one. Um, second one I have is, is train like life depends on it because it does. Um, I've been following your stuff, Tony, for a long time with the May Day Mondays and try to enact it here, um, in regards to it, because it is just that, that important. And Kyle's a testament to his training, what we had done there. Um, not only just what we did at station 12 and those crews, but what he had prior to it. Um, and then on the fire grounds for me, um, this kind of goes, there is, is slow down. Um, I'm not a huge fan of people running on the fire ground in regards to that is I'm all about slow down and work with the purpose. Um, you don't need to, to run everywhere because when you start running, you start missing things. Um, I'd rather you walk with a brisk walk and work your work with the purpose because you're going to get the job done a whole lot faster and more efficiently that way. And the last thing is continue to mentor others, no matter what rank you're at, no matter where you're at in an organization, always reach out the hand to help mentor somebody else. Yeah. That's awesome. And, you know, that's one of the things that seems to be a, a recurring theme with uh, some of our May Day Monday guests is take the time to make the time, right? Um, that uh, tactical pause was last month we talked about mm -hmm. with uh, Chief Schaefer, um, but uh, but we do. It, it, it pays dividends, right? If you can get the more information you, you can bring in, uh, it, it's going to it's going to work work in your favor and, and you'll be able to to, to, to find out the problem quicker and be able to, to react to it. So that, that's good stuff. Jason, train them. Uh, probably the, the, the main things I would like to pass on to everybody is, it, you know, um, be a student of the job like Kyle. Um, he's very passionate, uh, learning every aspect of why things work the way they did ask questions, you know, uh, get your hands on tools so you know how to operate them, why they operate the way they do. So if you get yourself in a jam, uh, you can use them in different ways that they're, that will uh, help mitigate your situation and stuff like that. Uh, just be a student of the job, read everything, stay off Facebook, stay off all that other stuff, <laughs> except if you're looking at fire engineering. And stuff like that. <laughs> uh, also, it's okay not to be okay. Um, if you want to get, get help, uh, it can be frustrating at times. Uh, you you got to need the right tool for the right job. You need the right therapist for the right job. Sometimes they're not going to click with people. It took me seven different ones to finally click with my trauma psychologist. All right. Don't give up. There is hope. There is help. And there's love out there for everybody. Don't give up. Just raise your hand. Your pit crew will come running. Uh, last but not least, I don't care if you got one day on the job, 10 years on the job, 30 years on the job. Listen to the new guy. Somebody you're supposed to mentor. They, they very well can mentor you. They have ideas as well. Keep your ears open. Listen to them. They're trying to tell you something. 
That's good stuff. And um, I, I think that we, that's going to be the new motto for Mayday Monday is there's love everywhere. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you guys for coming on. I really appreciate it. Um, Thank you. Thank I you. do want to hit on, I do want to hit on um, the, this month's skill drill is to practice calling the Mayday. Um, it's, it's, I remember this, this fire that happened with Kyle, um, 12 hours before, 12 hours before Kyle was, was calling the Mayday. Um, I was training, we were, we were training at the uh, academy there, um, on, on Mayday, on, um, firefighter down stuff. So, um, those, those, those members, right. There's, there's a practice to this. There's, there's a reason we do it. And um, you want to you want to try and get out as much information as possible. Uh, we focus on the lunar mnemonic, but remember that the important stuff: who, what, where. So uh, whatever you do, you know, have a plan and practice that plan. Um, put yourself in some stressful situations too. Uh, get your get your guys out there in their gear with their with their radios. Um, you know, get them get them hyped up. Maybe get their uh, get their heart rate up. Um, so that we do focus on, right? Get some of those, um, those fine motor skills. Uh, if the heart rate's up, we lose some of those things, but we still want to be able to call a mayday because when this is happening, your heart rate's going to be through the roof. And, you know, where are you in your, in your ability to do this? Um, maybe get some str other stress, uh, you know, make some loud noises, get some saws going in the background so that these guys have to focus on what they're, what they're doing. Uh, because again, uh, this is a life-saving skill. Um, if, when, when you're looking at this month's May Day, there's a couple of links in there. One is to the NIOSH report and one is to the county, Prince William County internal report. And then there's also a link on there to a, um, to a, uh, video on YouTube that will, um, talks and it shows you the, uh, the recreation, right? The, the thermal, the thermal stuff, the, uh, uh the simulation that, that NIST did, and you can look at that and get an idea. It, it kind of talks, it shows you how quickly things, conditions change. Um, the report doesn't do, doesn't, doesn't, you, you may not be able to get exactly out of the report. So pair that with the video and you'll be able to put some of these things together. Again, um, Jason and Jason, uh, you guys were, were really great. Uh, I pre appreciate you doing this. Um, we, we won't, we won't forget Kyle. Um, it, it's, it's too important. Um, he's done so much for us even after his death that um, we're not going to, we're going to, we're going to continue to carry this thing on. A um, couple other things for everybody out there. Uh, there's a big thing coming up later this month, uh, Indianapolis. If you're out there, I'll be there. We'll be uh, doing a class on Mayday Mondays. Um, if you follow Mayday Mondays, it might be a repeat when you, when you come there for the class, but uh, we're going to, we're going to dig into these things. We'll talk about this. We'll, we'll focus on some of the three things that each one of these these people have told us and we'll give you some skill drills. Uh, I think I'm on Thursday after the opening ceremonies. If you're looking for a class uh, while you're out at FDIC, uh, chief, uh, Bobby, thanks for coming. You have some thank final you, thoughts. Thank you for having me. I, I, I will be at FDIC also. Um, and just so you know, we have our friends of bill meeting every morning. So if you're a friend of bills, please come. We also have a trained fire psychologist from the Florian program there, uh, therapists, uh, counselors, Dan DeGrice is always available to guys and gals. So if you're, if you are coming um, and we also have the dry fools. So uh, lots of, lots of groups for us and, and our, and especially us three car fans, um, you know, yeah. <laughs> three car baby. I, I, I can't stop myself three car. But um, for those of you who don't know that, <laughs> how can you not know Dale Earnhardt three car. So, so um but thank you. And, and it, it just to echo Tony, Kyle will never be forgotten, at least not on our watch. And, uh, and thank you both. You guys were uh, amazing. And we also have Mike Gagliano and Ann who do marriage counseling and are also available for folks to talk to. Uh, you know, if Jason's story resonated with you, uh, you know, uh, Friends of Bill is AA meeting for those of you who don't know. And if you're not a member of AA and you've never gone because you didn't know what kinds of folks are gonna be there, please come. Your fellow firefighters, just like me and Jason, will we'll be happy to talk to you. Um, it's a, uh, it, it's it's, to me, there's nothing better in life than being happy and sober. Um, it, it really is what life's really about. 
you know, uh, the, 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 it's just, it's wonderful. So you'll be among, you'll be among your fellow firefighters and, and you'll be welcome. You know, if you're not sure you should be there, Chuck, just come visit, you know, it, it, it doesn't, there's a, you don't have to qualify. <laughs> there's no CPAT. <laughs> Come on in uh, and uh, lots of other great events. Uh, the Fool's Bash is Wednesday night. Stop, drop, rock and roll is Thursday night. The 5K Fun Run is being sponsored by the Firefighter Cancer Support Network, which is something we haven't spoken about tonight, but obviously every single one of us knows somebody with cancer. So you, you can run in their honor. You can run to support them. You can run in their memory. We just love to have you there. Um, we've also got the 9-11 the Memorial Stair Climb on Friday. We'd love to see you there, Lucas Oil Stadium. The MSA block party is Thursday night, and the union uh, guys are throwing a party with live dancing, which is just a blast, uh, and a couple of uh, tents uh, at, at the uh, union hall. And then thousands and thousands of other things just going on. Uh, backyard barbecue, which is, all these things are free. Uh, backyard barbecue being sponsored by the Combat Challenge folks. Um, so just an, an amazing time. And, and um, I got two phone calls today, one was from Dan DeGrice, about hotel space, I can't help you. Um, it's just that sold out already. It's that crowded. Uh, there are some space left in some of the hands-on training classes. Several are sold out. I apologize, but this close to uh, FDIC, you know, things like Red Under Fire and some of the other classes, uh, nozzle forward and a few are uh, full up. Uh, uh, making the grab, uh, Grant Schwabies. So some of them are, are completely full and we, we can't add people. Uh, instructor, as you all know, uh, Jason, uh, with training, uh, instructor and, and Tony, instructor student ratio is, is paramount to, in sa to safety. So please come. It's going to be a wonderful time. Um, it, it's the first post COVID show. Um, so we'll be hugging and kissing and handshaking and <laughs> doing all the stuff we were told not to do for the last two years. So um, we're allowed to do that again. And we're going to with reckless abandon. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, th and thank you to, uh, to your to Prince George County for allowing you to speak so openly Prince and honestly. William. And Prince William, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, you print all the princes out there. Um, and, 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 uh, but thank you for, thank you to your job and, and thank you for your courage and your honesty. And, and um, it really speaks volumes about your character and the character of the men and women that you work with, that, that you are as forthright as you are and, and as, uh, as I think impactful as you are. And if people want to get a hold of either one of you, they can do it through Tony. Um, Tony will be happy to share their contact information. Um, and, and obviously now with Jason involved in counseling, there, there's a, there's a firefighter to talk to, you know, give them a call. Don't yeah. Don't want to ask him to build a house, but you can ask him, <laughs> to, uh, you ask him for that. And, and, uh, no and power tools. No, thank you guys. Yeah, thank, we don't want again. your power tools. <laughs> Thanks again, guys. And right. one other thing about FDIC, come check out the ISFSI booth. I'll be there throughout the week. Um, you can see we'll have some pop-up events if you want to come uh, hang out with some of the instructors. So thank you. Thanks, Bobby. Bye-bye, all. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you. God bless. God bless.